when it comes to education? No. Like Joel said, there are tons of educated librarians at home and in the diaspora. All they need is a space so that they can make that contribution. Amen. Thank you very much. Wow. So we do have three ladies on stage. We're about to talk about something very emotional, the issue of rape and sexual violence in Liberia. Amen. Two days ago, Princess Coco cops, I, I don't want to call it dead body. They played with it, they have done a whole lot of tests on it, and finally her family received the body two days ago. Princess Coco was said to have been arrested and it was covered up. Princess Coco, that was said to be natural, but she was bleeding in the backyard of a stole. Princess Coco, they, they have over 10 different stories about Princess Coco's death. But, generally speaking, the issue of rape and sexual violence has become uh, almost a natural phenomenon in Liberia, especially in the streets, just because these people or these girls do not have employment. So, prostitution, so to speak, has become an employment. Amy, I'd like to ask you this question now. I, I will ask all of the, panel, the female panel to wait on that, and then the, the guys can come as well. Uh, what are the tactical solutions to limit prostitution rate as it has become a source of income for our young girls in Liberia? And what can we do to distract them from this strategy or way of life? I get teary every time I hear anything that has to do with sexual violence, prostitution, rape, because I've been there as a child. You know, so it's a, it's a personal thing for me. Not for anybody to feel sorry for me, because I, you know, by the grace of God, overcame. So I'm in a good place, but I think you, you said the answer within your question, education. Create jobs. You know, for these young women, I think Liberians are one of the smartest group of people. I truly believe that in my heart, that we're one of the smartest people, and I think women are very smart, very intelligent in Liberia. But a lot of them are not given the opportunity to exercise their giftings and their talents, right? I'm one of those that believe that you don't need to, I don't think everybody will get a master's degree. No. But there's room for vocational schooling. Their trade, people would say trade where you get carpentry and all those things, um, culinary, you're able to do something. It's the, to create jobs for these women. There's something that I've noticed in Liberia that people think solves the problem or the issue is for them to keep procreating just procreation, which is a gift from God, as we all know, right? But if you don't have the, the finance to upkeep these people that you're bringing into this world because they're responsibility, right? Then at the end of the day, mothers and fathers would rather their babies sleep around. And it's not by choice most of the time. It's because of a need. Where you have a girl with five to six siblings and she's pretty much the head of the household. Mom is too old to bend her back. Dad is doing something else. So you have this younger woman who's 14, 15 years old, would rather sleep with these disgusting people in government. Okay? And they have their kids at home, but they're sleeping with these young women, all in the name of an opportunity. Yes. That, if that is not sickness, and witchcraft to the highest degree, I don't know what is. That's the issue, is the fact that these people, you have these men, prominent men in government could say, hey, I see you like my daughter, for crying out loud. Why don't you do this, I'll teach you, get a job, this and that. But no, there's always, I need something from you. And it's, your, it's not your mind, it's your body. They need your body, so at the end of the day, these young women, prostitution has become normal now, normalized. It's a normal thing. Yes. They become promiscuous, and then you have people who they themselves don't know anything. They sit around and judge these younger 
women. They say, hey, you just want to be useless. You want to do this and that. Well, the grown men that are sleeping with these women, with these babies, are the ones who are useless. Yeah. Because they know better. You know what I'm saying? So you know better, but you choose not to do better, all because of selfish reasons. You're choosing not to do better. And that's the biggest thing we have. A woman can walk and she can be educated like myself. My mom always tells me this. Emily, if you're in Liberia, you would have five or six kids by now. Because men would just chase after you just to sleep when you have a kid and move on. Even if you're educated, I have a master's degree. But I can guarantee if I go back, a man will probably just want to sleep with me to get me a job. And not because of my level of intellect that I'm qualified. It's almost like that your body will determine if you're qualified or not. That's the issue that we have, that these people, these filthy older men that are in power, even women who are in power, encourages these things. Jobs are not being created. And these young women think the only way is fast money. What is 30 seconds of sex? You get about 50 US dollars. Or they give you everything that you want. You talk about the lady who um, her course was brought to her parents and all these things. And I, I don't know the full story, so I'm not even going to get into it. But there's a deeper, there's a deeper story to what the media is sharing with us as to what's been going on with the sugar daddy, the sugar mama, all these things that are prolonging prostitution. That these little babies, my mom was telling me the other day that when she was growing up, that a two-year-old child was raped. Hey! Raped. Two years of age. And I said they should have killed him. Right there and then. Two years of age was raped. And nothing was done. At the end of the day, you walked away from that. You're destroying these young ladies. Let me tell you, trauma, which Liberians is something that we undermine, is a real thing. I was traumatized for 10 years of my life after molestation. 10 good years it took me to get to a place of healing. So imagine these young women that are being great, and mine was just by one person. So imagine being taken advantage of by multiple people that you look up to to protect you. They're the ones that are abusing you every single day. That you don't matter. Your body does not matter. That is a conversation that, again, I'm passionate, all right? Because this is, this is a personal matter. But it's, it's something that we really have to do something about. And the first thing is, First of all, mental health is a thing. Create a space for these young women to talk about it. I don't want to hear any pastor tell me to pray trauma away. I don't want to hear it from you. Because you don't know the trauma I've been through. You don't know the level of pain I've experienced. Stop telling me to pray and tell me to talk about it. That's the first step. Those things, when it's put in place, I believe it will live in prostitution, where a woman can say, you know what, I've been through everything, but I have value. Yes. And it's not too late. Yes. I use everything that happened to me as a child when I was in Ghana, and I told myself, Emily, you'll be the best of the best. You'll go to school, you get education, you make an impact. Those people, the person that, that molested you, and thought you're always going to be a victim, you're going to be victorious. I utilize that. But a space was created for me, and I had people in my corner that supported me. That's what we need for these young women. Oh. I like to tie this into the justice system. The culture of impunity has affected our nation so greatly. I had the privilege to serve as a police officer in Liberia for seven years. Came to Liberia, I mean, came to the United States of America, and the only thing I thought to do is how can I go back to fight the culture of opinion? Call it. You are an Antonio Law. We have the story of Emmy, the story of Princess Coco, the story of the two years of child. How do we battle? This situation from a legal perspective, the culture of opinion. From a legal perspective, it starts with holding those oppressors accountable. 
I believe women in the diaspora and in Liberia have talked about this subject enough. It has been beaten into the ground. Women have been at the forefront of this movement. And I believe that no real change can really come forward until the men become a part of that conversation and start holding the other men accountable. Wow. And that starts with any sort of social problem, right? Take racism, for example. How are, you, how are we, as black people, going to dismantle the system of racism if we don't have our white brothers and sisters joining in arms with us, right? So how are we going to solve the problem of rape in Liberia if we don't have men also on the front lines? On the front lines, in their working places, in every single environment where it's happening, they have to also step forward, once, for one thing, acknowledging the issue, and two, figuring out what is their role to combat it. And so I think that when we, when we do that, then these uh, uh, incidents can be um, uh, uh, adjudicated in the legal uh, field. But we need the men to join in on the conversation and not just you know, during um, you know, political season that you join in in the conversation because this is happening for um, women every single day. It's not just during a political time. Um, I also want to talk about it from a, from a non-political, um, a non-legal uh, perspective as well. When Emily was talking about opportunity, you know, I think sometimes we think about opportunity, you know, in high school or when you get to be, you know, of working age, right? But the first opportunity, it starts in your family, right? The other day I was on Facebook and you know all the time I'm seeing these uh, GoFundMe campaigns, um, you know, help this person here, help this person here, and I came across uh, one. It was a young, promising Liberian woman, very you know educated, had you know uh, many scholarships from I don't know if it was U.S. or Europe, and she was requesting for help right, in order to cover some of her um, educational fees in order to come from Liberia to come to America. And I said, okay, this is very interesting. I'm always, you know, about Liberian topics. Let me click this link and, and figure out why is it that we need to help this sister. And when I read the story, she said she had to put her education on hold because her parents decided to educate the son instead of her. And I was really taken back. Now, I don't know their family situation, and I'm not judging it, right? But I'm saying that it happens far too often at the nuclear level where parents pick and choose genders, which one that they will educate, which ones you know they will push forward to become to go and do something productive in society, and they choose the male because they look at their odds and they look at how society is, and they say the male will have a better chance at succeeding in society. So let me pick him, and I will pay his school fees while the girl stays at home. But what they fail to realize is that when that man grows up, he's gonna get a wife of his own and he's going to go to his family. But it's most of the time that the women and the women who are in the room know this, that they will stay and be providers in their homes. And whatever education that they get, it will not even just impact one person, it will impact a whole community of people who may not even be related to them. So sometimes that opportunity starts from being, from um, choosing your daughter and, and, and speaking life into her and pouring resources into her so that when she grows up, she's not forced to make a hard decision about whether or not she has to uh, succumb to the pressures from the, uh, from the males in order to even be something in life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
from the business world, Frida, we like to uh, wrap up with this and then we'll ask the gentleman to throw in. I'd like to challenge the gentleman. I think it's time for the men to get in and uh, we will hear a recommendation from the gentleman on stage. But uh, Frida, here is the thing. Every business center, every business establishment in the United States of America you visit, there is a clear start to our laws around uh, sexual harassment. And you, you, you from the business world, and I mean, as a matter of fact, it is, it, it is, it is a law that you have to put that in the company policy from the very stage of employment. What can you recommend on the issue of sexual harassment, as far as from a business perspective, or you know, as a nation, what should we do? What do you think will help to alleviate the issue of sexual harassment in Liberia? Hmm. I mean, I think that. The question that comes to mind is what systems of value do we follow in Liberia? Because it seems like everything is just overlooked, you know? It seems like abuse is overlooked um, and people just get away with a lot of things like um, Cole said, there's no accountability. Um, and it takes me back to the Lord. Yes, I'm a Christian. And I will answer the question, but one of the things that's important to keep in mind as leaders and as believers is to always make room for the faith to be expressed. Because people out there who believe in different things, they don't, they don't care if you like it or don't like it, they're gonna tell you about it anyways. And if we have systems from the Lord that actually helps us to behave ourselves, and be good members of society and we hold back because we feel like, well, I don't want to offend anyone because I'm a Christian and they're not. We need to really stop that because I think that if we push um, the Christian faith, if we push the, the Bible, people will, people will take to those values. I don't know what's going on in Liberia, but not only there, but here, a lot of women get abused and they don't say nothing about it. I was abused. I talked to three ladies that I work with, they were abused. So I'm like, I talked to a fourth lady, she was abused. And I'm like, this is occurring a lot among us and it's not okay. Why is it that we're not talking about it? Why is it that we're not talking about changing that? I just wanted to really push that, that we need to really teach our, our children. I don't have a kid yet, but fam uh, uh, parents and those who have a family, we need to push the Lord more because when they take on to God's value, you know, the way things are being done is gonna change. Um, but anyways, as far as the business sector, when Zika spoke, and he talks about the books that his mom used to buy for him. That is such a great thing your mom did. Since we see that we can't change the education system right now in Liberia, we need to push the agenda of reading. The young people need to read because there's a lot of knowledge in books, not only uh, um, business books, but just any kind of book that has something good to offer. We need to push that that's a great way to help our nation, our people grow in, you know, as far as knowledge wise. And then um, with business, I think it's just, it, it comes down to training. It comes down to just setting, I, I work with a lot of courses, I create courses, I make sure people pay for them because if people don't pay for things, they don't value it. And I train people on different aspects of, of business and so, you know, that can be something that, you know, can be implemented as far as teaching what is okay in the workplace and what is not okay in the workplace. And I think these things need to be talked about more again because if it's not, people feel like they can get away with abuse and rape and all of those disgusting things. And so that's what I'll say, just training and, and pushing the agenda of that. And then quickly to wrap up. It's another task to get the people to be interested in it because they're always looking for what can I get from it? You know, like, are you going to pay me to get educated? So that's another thing to think about. But I think those trainings can definitely be created and made available for people to go through. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go to the gentleman on the stage, do we have questions from the audience regarding education and the issue of rape? Do we have questions from anybody in the audience? Please. 
But I'm so impressed and I want to bless God for all of you on the panel and give me a freedom for her presentation. I think it was either, either or a freedom that mentioned our change starts from here. Yes. The country Liberia, the change starts from here. So with different ideas in mind that I don't want to share now because it is your platform and it is you we look up to because our ideas somewhere or the other is deformed now. <laughs> so one yeah, we 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 did either, either mentioned that we didn't transfer anything. Yeah. What we did we see when we distracted me. We transfer corruption and we live in corruption. We transfer abuse and no in no justice and we live in it. So she did all right, everything you said, one thing I want to know, what is from everyone on the panel, what is your decision now? from the change starting from here. As our concluding uh, remark. So thanks for asking that. It will definitely be addressed just at the end of this because we are sitting here, we have recommendations, we have suggestions, and we are going to be posting uh, 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 challenging the community, you, back as to how you can empower us to take on this new mantle. Because we are cognizant of the fact that this mantle is going to bring change. Having said that, Two hours. Oh, sorry, one more question. Okay, um, my name is Jadali Omega Dumbo, and uh, I'm honored to be here. I think this is the first Liberian uh, meeting I've come to. And I'm a professional in leadership and in change. Amen. I believe in justice. So, uh, my legal practitioner, um, with all of these things, that has to do with corruption, the educational sector, and rape. What is the way forward when it comes to these things? Because I think we've just talked about the problem. But I believe in solution. To the panelists, what do you think we need to do? Even our forefathers that did not transfer those knowledge to us were left off with corruption and our own future. Mm -hmm. yes. What do you think we need to do? I um, actually grew up in Liberia. I lived there all through the war. I never left and I went to school and I went to college and I also worked. I work with NGOs and I work in government. So I was able to see both how the NGOs work, like the international people, people that came from other countries and also I uh, ran a World Bank program, I work with United Nations. I'm not breaking, I'm trying to give an example. And I also work with the like, regular Liberian like, government. And I moved to the U.S. in my um, 30s. So these are some of the things that are our problems. But we've talked a lot about the problems. I don't want to rush and answer the questions, but I already have it listed down and may help um, to answer the other questions. Every country has good and bad. One of the things we need to do is to weed out, you know, when you're doing harvesting or when you're a farmer and you notice that they're bad, the weed is with, with Bible people, right? Bible talking about the weed and the tears. Yeah. It's time to take away the tears. The bad, the bad, the, the Bible talking about the seed and the tears, the good weeds and the bad weeds. Mm -hmm. So we have to weed out the bad things, the corruption, the rape, and principle. Everything is all about principles. So there we're saying I will use um, this church as an example. Reverend Topline is team, they're regular Liberians just like us. So they were sitting in this sanctuary because of principles. Accountability. Check and balance. Monitoring and evaluation. Coming back and say, hey, when you plant a garden, you always want to go back and check it and say, hey, I see something wrong. Honesty. And not just Liberia, because like you said, no country will grow above the citizens. Yeah. We are the problem. Yes. We're, uh, so if we're honest, the ministry where you work, the department you work will be honest. I remember running a program and I would get letters from ministers and I tell them, I can tell them to their face. And that's why I just gave up and I left, honestly. They would tell you, hey, I need $10,000, we're going to have a game. And I said, I'm not giving the money, that's not the purpose. And what would they do? They will fire you. Yeah, they will. It's the truth. But when you work with the international partners 
every two weeks, every every Monday there is a meeting, and everybody is giving a report. And if you spend ten dollars, you must be able to bring receipts to show how you spend that ten dollars. And when you take those principles in the government, you are hated. So what can we do? We need principles. What works in America? If we go back and apply the same good things, we will get the same results. You plant cucumber in America, you plant cucumber in Liberia, you're not going to get egg, you're going to get cucumber. So it's about principles. We have to apply the right principles. Honestly, um, and we also have to build up on the good things. We have some really good things. I have not entered college in America, but I've worked with the first company I worked at right out of my immigrant coming to like it was it's the top company when it comes to insurance. And I have not been to any school, nobody can believe it. Going to school in Kisito, walking through an excuse mess. Yes. But when assignments were given, we did our assignments. Yeah. And in that same school there were people sleeping around. So we can build upon what we have. Then we come to the family because as we learn in civics, and I think one recommendation would be introduce civics back in school, not from seventh grade, but from maybe even kindergarten, start to teach these things. The family is the nuclear cell of society. Every one of us comes from a family. I was blessed to be a third, third generation educated woman. My grandmother was a teacher, my mom was a teacher, and I'm educated because of them. Now, there are some people who are first generation, so what do you want to do? You want to look at yourself and say, am I the first person in my family that's going to high school? That means you have people looking at you. Your children are going to have to come and do better. Like I tell my son, your father is doing his PhD. You cannot stop with a master's degree. You have to claim on top of him and get two PhDs. <laughs> so you have to realize, hey, my mom was not educated, but she sent me to school. My grandmother was educated, but she sent me to school. So let us build upon the good that we have. Everybody is from a different background. Let us put up on the group that we have and then we get a better Liberia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, before the last question, get back to you. So, should be closing up uh, round number five? Yeah. Uh, praise the Lord. It's, very, it's not a question, but just something that I just want to say. We as Liberians will always say our country was built on a Christian principle. That's what we will always say. But do we do the Christian principle? If you say you are for God, your life 100% must represent this Jesus. Because he will never withhold his hand from blessing that name. But we say we are believers. We don't act like it. We don't live it. There will not light to shine. Let it shine like that. Hallelujah. And the Bible says when the righteous rule, when the wicked rule, the people suffer. But when the righteous reign, the people rejoice. Proverbs 9. So, as a leader goes, so goes the country. I'm not here, it's not a politics. But even from development places, and or anything, and even this ministry. If Pastor Pat and Atanga was a scoffer and don't care leader, this church will not be where it is. Greatness starts from the head. It goes down. Great that starts from the head. And one of the things that is killing us, one, I would say we don't love one another. Yes. Two, we don't speak good of ourselves. Yes. Job places, sometimes I feel this God's scared to go in break room. Yes. When you hear like you were talking about like you yes. and sometimes I will sit and my eyes will be red, I will grieve. Then the dream will say, but I don't know that people to be in defense. I say yes. I will be in defense. My neighbor should about me. It's Liberia. You want Liberia to go forward. You don't even speak good things about Liberia. Where well, in the Lord, you are a Ghana man, a Nigerian man. You speak the good word in another man's country. And the crisis you speak it into your country. And you want to see progress? It can work like that. Our Father Arm is still open to bless. But we're looking for him for the progress. 
Amen. And I'm in prayer and I'm talking with okay. I said, some of us, you will say all the wicked things about our nation. Speaking the back to yourself. But some of us are in the background. We're seeking God yes. for the problem of our country. Yes. And these ones that are sitting here, the ones that the Lord has brought to listen. I'm not talking as a boast, but my heart cry for my country. Yes. Especially in 2021, I went there. I went on a church program. In the car, the traffic, by the time I can get to the church, the program over. The traffic, you can't even get through. But I pray for this what our Father Christ has started. Yes. Let it be manifested to this generation. We may be old and dead and gone, but you words we are speaking. God is here with it and God will manifest it in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we are scared of our The, the answer, or oh, the answer? Okay, we get it right to the answer that I promise you. We, 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 we go in straight to two things, have care, economy, and corruption, and we answer the questions and we are done. So one thing for each of the panelists, please give me your position on what you think Liberia economy is and what are your recommendations. I'll start with Mr. Tuber. Well, the economy is terrible, everybody knows it. The library economy wouldn't be better if that for Liberia is diaspora. They're only getting through by the day because of how much money we send through money from the Western Union. So as much as we love our country, we want to do better. But again, we all should go out and be accountable for the state of the economy because they ain't have the powers in their hands. They control our resources. We cannot be afraid of telling them to do the right thing. Ziga. Yeah. Um Again, I would take it from another angle. I think the responsibility is on Liberians. Um, the government is in charge, but we put the government there. We have to be very cognizant of the people we elect to power. You know, people like the, the decisions that they make, you follow the lifestyle. You don't want for somebody to come around you during election time and say, come and vote for me. Before elections, like, if you don't know who you're supposed to vote for at this time, then, you know, that's a problem, right? Because the people who are going to be steering your, your country, taking your country forward, you should be interested. Many of us, what we do is say, oh, not interested in, in politics. But then we complain about Liberia. We all have to be interested because whoever is in the country is going to take us where they are going. You know, if you have a blind, like they said, blind, leave the blind. And then we all will go where the person is headed. So we have to be very confident of the fact we all have to get involved. All of us here. You're not in Liberia, maybe you're not voting, but you are influencing other people. You have to start to talk to them. I remember in 2005, right, I didn't vote, but my, my dad was calling me and telling me about, you know, about the elections and, you know, telling me, who you wanted me to vote for? And he was giving me a reason. I would ask him why. And he gave me a reason. Eventually, I, like, talked to be convinced, but he convinced me. And I, support, I was supporting the candidate even though I didn't vote. But then I started to encourage other people. So you, all that you know, sometimes people back in Liberia, they, people take advantage of the poverty, right? And they will come to them. But if you hear you have your relatives that are in help, don't say they don't listen to me. You know, like the, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing. So sometimes you can use that same principle, right? Keep talking to people and they will listen eventually. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay, I'll be short. Um, Improving our economy goes hand in hand with loving ourselves and also being patriotic. What I mean by that is that if we love ourselves as Liberians and we love our country and we're patriotic about where we come from and our land, that will influence our decision making when it comes to who we elect. So we elect uh, politicians who are transparent, who uh, are about good governance and who have uh, plans, right? Um, it also affects our decision making with, um, you know, countries who may be impacting and influence Liberia in um, negative ways. You know, take Ghana and, and other countries where, you know, maybe you will have a, a foreign country, like for example, China, you know, come into your country and is doing, you know, different development um, uh, projects. But if you find that China or whatever foreign country is in your government is actually stealing from your government or, you know, not um, training uh, your nationals to also do those same jobs so that we can become self-sufficient, 
what do you do? You don't compromise because you love yourself the best, so you kick them out, yes. right? And so we have a problem of not doing that. We compromise too much because we don't love ourselves. If you love yourself, you will not compromise on anything, right? No matter what type of money that they're giving you, you will still find a way to make a way without their help. And that's what I really love about those other countries that don't compromise. And so I, I think that that's at the root of it all, just loving yourself so much that you will think ahead, you will plan into 2030, you will plan into 2040, you will elect qualified leaders, and you will um, not compromise. Thank you very much, Joe. So I know we like to say the economy of Liberia is horrible. I would use a different approach. I would say the economy of Liberia is open. Liberia is for sale and is open for business. Um, to the to the Turkish mining company, the economy in Liberia is not horrible. To China, the economy in Liberia is not horrible. To Europe, the economy in Liberia is not horrible. But to Liberia, the economy in Liberia is horrible. Um, what we can do is let our money have value, meaning stop just giving loose money to Liberia. Thank you. Give money with a purpose and expect a return and expect that to have an impact on that person's life. Thank you very much, Andy. I don't know if I can top everything everybody else just said, uh, but I will say uh, what Cole said, right, is the, the whole self-love, Joel and then Zika and, and Gibson, what everybody is saying, I think integrity is a huge thing that goes along with self-love. You know, we talk about love and country, um, love and self, and stuff like that. Matthew 6, uh, Matthew 6, 21 says, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is, right? Um, and I think people need to start having heart for the country. You know, it's one thing to have a mindset. It's another thing to have a heart. There's a place in the Bible that even Samuel said, God, God himself told Samuel, when he was ready to ordain David, to anoint David as king. And he told Samuel, he said, I look at the heart, but man looks at the outward appearance. It's possible to have somebody in Liberia who's not educated as president, but because of the heart they have for that country, they would elect educated people to run the country. So Liberia does not just have lack of resource problem, but the people that's in leadership is the heart. Yes. We need a heart search for the people that's going in leadership. It's true, but the people that's going in leadership. We need, we need a heart, we need a heart transplant yes. from God to give us that ability to see people the way he sees them. If you want to test if a man is humble and if he has a heart for the Lord, place him in a place of power. And you'll understand whether he loves God or he loves himself, or he loves people. That's the difference. It's so much, because we can all sit here, let's be real, let's keep it 100. We can all sit here and talk about we're gonna do this and do this and do that. The moment you enter power, the devil is also after you, as much as God is speaking to you. So it's up to you to either listen to the voice of God, to serve his people, because God loves everybody in Liberia the same. Right? It's either you listen to the voice of God to serve his people with the heart that he has, or you listen to the voice of the devil to exalt yourself above the nation and to think that you're righteous. So I think our issue, economy, education, X, Y, and Z, it starts with a heart transplant. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's amazing. Um, so God needs to be at the top of our priority. I think that's been established, correct? God needs to be the top of our priority in life. Secondly, I'll say that we need to help empower the people of Liberia to create businesses. Um, and when you go to Liberia, you see that they're very passionate and they're hardworking. And so they just need to be supported to create their own business because that actually helped boost the, the economy. Um, and that's one of the biggest thing in America. Small businesses really builds up the economy of this country. And so the people already have to drive. In Liberia, they already have to drive. They're ambitious. 
they, they want to learn, we need to find a way to support them and help them create their own business. And so I have a program that I, that I started. It hasn't really taken off yet, but it is specifically to help Liberians solve the problems in their community and turn that into a business. So for example, just to wrap up, you lack water for, the, for your, your little community that you live in, you lack water. How about you team up with smart people and you're trying to figure out that problem right in that community. You don't need to take on the whole Liberia. And that is how you create businesses. And then our people will not struggle for jobs. They won't have to be shipped out of the country all the time. And so I just say support our people to create for themselves instead of them having to depend on us or others. Thank you very much. We do not have too much time. In my opinion, I think it's about time for Liberia and Liberians to empower the private sector. And it's also time for Liberia and Liberians to strengthen the entire system. Having said that, I'd like to turn on to the panel to answer the questions because of time. First question, why are we here? What are we looking to solve and how we intend to do it? Second question is, what is the way forward? All of the problems are real. Healthcare, corruption, education, justice, and the children in the streets that need help. Why are we on this stage? And in five minutes, why are we on this stage? What are we trying to uh, communicate? Yeah. Who are we trying to communicate? And what is the way forward as we think? Start with you, Mr. Tudor. Okay, so for me personally, I'm here for love of country. Everything Liberia concerns me. Over 10, 11 years, I've been working with nonprofits in Liberia. I myself run my own nonprofit already called Change uh, Alliance for Conscious Change Leaders. If you check our website, Change Leaders that work, that's there's a lot of things we do down there. Uh, 2020, I got into business, established a clinic that worked more than 40, 45 thousand dollars. So this is all just to encourage other people. If I can do it as a single person, you too can go there and make a difference. You can do something. So let us all just work together, synergize our efforts. Every effort counts, and see how we can transform that theory. Thank you. Oh uh, yeah, I you know when I came to when I was in Liberia, I was very involved in different things, working with uh, you know women Palm, and I worked with Andrew Growth International Center, and we did a lot of stuff. But when I came to the U.S., you know, of course I was very engaged, but I was more with the church side and. Then I thought, but listen, if 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 um, I don't get involved in my country, you know, like I was, who am I expecting to get involved? You know, if I don't help to, if I have ideas that I think are useful to Nigeria, if I don't, you know, find a way to implement the ideas, who do I expect? You know, all of us have a responsibility. God brought us in that country for a reason. Right? We have everyone. We have a link to Liberia for a reason and we have to all help. And as an individual, I've already created an idea. I've been doing still helping a lot of young people there and like to establish businesses with my own finances. But I also developed an idea that I'm going to be pushing forward. I can't really talk much about it right now, but and it's an opportunity for you know, you know professionals to work together and that we can build a support Liberia. So I'm also here for the love of Liberia. I bet if we took a survey on the stage right now, I probably spent the least amount of time in Liberia. I was born in 95 and I left in 96. So I only spent one year and I don't even remember. So I, I know I probably won that competition. And I went to Ivory Coast too, and that's where um, we lived for a few years before I came here when I was five. But I don't know what it is about Liberia that just keeps pulling me back. I just think that God put a, a fire in my heart, a love in my heart for my native country. And so I'm here because I'm thinking with that, um, that servant leader mindset. Um, I think that we need to focus on service in whatever area that you're passionate about. Um, I want to also be, uh, you know, honest and say that we can come here and you know talk about all the good things that we want to do, but if you don't actually commit your time, 
to do it, it's all in vain. Yes. And a lot of the times, the reason why some Liberians that are living in Liberia have a problem with us in the diaspora who just, you know, talk and talk and talk about what needs to be fixed is because we don't actually have a drive to actually go there and stay there. Not be a December, I like being December too. But we need to actually stay there for a longer period of time. The Nigerians, the Ghanaians, they do that. They come here, they collect their education, they collect their experience, and they actually go and live there. Not in just old age, in your, in your youth, in your prime. You actually have to be willing to do that, right? Or if for some reason you can't, right? Let's say, you know, because of our healthcare system um, that needs to catch up and maybe for healthcare reasons you can't go and live there, you need to actually have a, a support system on the ground who is doing that work continuously. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're being a hypocrite, to be honest, right? And so um, we need to pick our areas for servanthood uh, that we can impact the country for the long term, not just for a three months vacation that you got a PTO to get off from work and you think that that's all that it's going to take. It's going to take sacrifice, yes. real sacrifice. You're gonna to have to give up this American dream yes. to go and develop the Liberian dream. Wow. Yeah, sure. um, we have to come to our year. As a Liberian, I would say the love of liberty is part of um, With that being said, for myself personally, um, I recently started a construction company in Liberia called Rain Coast Construction. I'm also going to Liberia in August because we can't just keep speaking and not doing it. So I'm going to Liberia in August where I'll be donating my services one, one day a week at JFK Hospital in Monrovia. Um, and on a personal level, I want to help my family and I want to help my country. So anything that I can do to be a resource to Liberia and to be an asset and not a liability on my country and on our children's future, I'm all for it. That's why I'm here. Thank you, Emily. Yes, um, I haven't been back in 21 years and I do plan on going back, okay? I just haven't been back in, in, in 21 years, but Something that I want to do, and I promised my grandmother, blessed memory before she passed, was I would build her a foster care system. I'll be able to um, create homes for orphanage, an uh, orphanage home. And my mother dropped out of school when she was 19. She got pregnant, um, dropped out of school, and she always wanted to be a doctor. So I told her I'd build a hospital. Okay, so to employ other people which will help with employment and then with the orphanage home would also help create employment and then me personally, I'm all for church. Okay, I believe the church plays a huge role when it comes to Liberia, right? And it's, 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 it's one thing to preach behind the pulpit. It's another thing to take preaching to in the streets, which is something we need to do, not just to preach, but to train people. Because we, as church folks and me, we talk a lot. We don't act a lot, right? So I want to be able to create a coaching institution as a certified life and health coach, a coaching institution that will, that will train pastors and leaders, women and children to be better leaders in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm also going to build skyscrapers in the Liberia. <laughs> Banks, okay? Um, but. Um, what I want to say here, the way forward or why we're here, um, obviously you've heard us talk about these multiple problems. Um, the next step is on your program sheet, there's a barcode at the bottom because we want to unite with the community. We want you to scan that barcode code, excuse me, and then enter your information. We're going to connect with you so that we can talk about the next step. Um, so that's what I just want to share. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We believe the reason we are up here today is because we are passionate and for the love of country, we are here today. We throw this back to the community. We want to continue with this initiative and we want to make sure 
that with our knowledge and the empowerment that we've had, we're able to make some impartation in life in Liberia, whether government whatsoever. Having said that, we look forward to your support. This is not going to stop here. We throw that back at you, and we look forward to your support. That talks about the church, the community, and every institution here. We are able to do this, but with your help. God bless you. This is the Father in heaven, we thank you. Our nation is a crossroad, but there is a solution. We are moving forward. The dream of bringing the young people together is, is the beginning of a movement that you will use them to start. We pray that as other young people hear about their heart for the country, they will join. We pray that you will allow us to humble ourselves, to step aside and allow our young people to take our place. We pray for courage so that nothing negative happening in the community and in Liberia will deter them in the name of Jesus. We pray for resilience. We pray that you will connect them with those who will encourage them so that in the midst of trials, the vision you've given them will not die. In the name of Jesus. We pray also, Lord, for destiny help us. What you are prepared, waiting for such a time as like this. Amen. I commit all of our young people, those that are here and those that are not here, into your hands. Amen. I pray that you will lead their hearts to work as a team. In the past, we the adults have not united. We have fought against each other. We have not respected each other. But Lord, Give this younger generation the grace. We have not passed to them the mantle of unity. But Lord, we pray that you will unify them. In the almighty name of Jesus. Give them humble spirit to work as a team and work with one another. We just commit everything we have done here today into your hands. And we pray for the way forward in Jesus' name. Amen.
much than women. Very, very vital. It's, it's not feminism. There's feminism out there. But see the Liberian women and see the young children that we're talking about today. They are here and very excited. So this is something that God is doing for our country. And we must take it seriously. Thank God. We want to thank our MC, our own MC. Please give up for this. This whole, you know, our community. See, see yes, yeah, she took her time. All the Saturday meetings that we had, she, she, she just blessed us. And since Anna, we thank you so much. Amen. Amen. We want to thank all of our committee members. First of all, so we want to start by thanking the organization of Liberia in Minnesota OLM. The executive director was here, but he had to leave because of pressing engagement. Can we give a round of applause for OLM? <laughs> we also want to say thanks to LFA. LFA allowed us to get they are here. And the board member, he was here, but he had to leave because of time. But they gave us the opportunity to be able to go this route with our independence day to welcome our young people into this. And so our executive director, and we have uh, uh, um, leadership from the executive. They are all here in the front, Sister Marie, and Pastor, um, uh, Pastor Zina, and Pastor Manley. And yes, I think that's all the executive and those who are not here. We just want to the chat. Yes, Sister Marie, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, we, we are happy that you allowed this to happen. Sister Zina, um, Pastor Cole, for catching up the vision. When we first Amen. met, um, we were there in our first meeting. Amen. They caught the vision and the red what it inspired us to be here and gave us the support. We want to say thank you. During this time, now because the committee was not constituted by the board to be standing, uh, it was created by the executive uh, 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 leadership of LMA. We did not intend to be a continual committee. When an event come up, because of their dedicated services, they will still be called upon to play roles in this uh, uh, kind of a program. So, cameraman. Not forgetting our cameraman, Mr. Zoka. Yes. Can we put our hands together for Mr. Zoka? Yes, there's a new camera that he bought. And now we we'll are call on our Mercedes Zina for our benediction. Amen. Haven't we been blessed? Yes. Amen. I just want to say something real quick. Our sister that was up here, our daughter, called Guano, is running in the primary for City Council Brooklyn Center. And the way we start this initiative is to Efrega, all of the team, Zika, call these people to go and knock doors with her. If we must effect change, we got to start it now. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord for this time. We thank you that we will be a part of it. We thank you for our young people and what our ears heard today. We pray God the fire that's in their heart will not just stop here, but as they say, some of them are even in Liberia doing businesses. Bless their efforts for God. As we leave to begin our work week, we pray your presence and your blessings to go with us. Take us safely to our various homes so that we can have a wonderful time with our family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. God bless. Bye-bye.